breaks. Does anybody have any questions over anything that we've looked at, done? I know it's been a week and a half or so. Okay, so get out the documents in Drive dealing with kinetics of crystal violence. Now this is the one I'm going to do as a demo lab, <coughs> but I, I want you guys to at least see it, experience it from, you know, at, at, although it be from afar, I don't deem it necessary to spend an entire class period on this activity, okay? Which it would take if you guys were doing it back in the lab. So one of the reasons why it would take <laughs> as long as it's would is because you would need to make a set of standards. If you remember what we did with the uh, copper, we had a set of cuvettes that had different concentrations and we put them in the colorimeter and we determined what their the slope was so we could determine the concentration. I mean, that would take the bulk of the class period, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you guys record the information in the document as we go here, rather than preparing the solutions yourself, okay? So <coughs> I've got this, well, that's kind of blurry, but that's just probably because it's bright. Alright, so I'm going to go through and uh, I've got the thing set, we're going to calibrate it. You guys are going to record the values uh, as we go, okay? So here is the pure. Clear? Pure. Pure. So this would be the crystal violet. I think it says 25 micromolar in the table. Is that correct? Got a funny looking U thing in front of it. Okay, so call it 1.062. Now this time around, because I'm going to be doing it, I'm going to go ahead and calibrate it in between each time. So this is going to be the 40 milliliter. Point nine four zero. This is going to be thirty five milliliter. What was the previous one? Put what? Okay. Call us from point nine two one. Andrew, that that is recorded, right? I was I just want to double check. Yeah. Uh, 0 0.30 or 30, 30 milliliter.
Next one's 25, is that right? Twenty milliliter. Point five three seven. Point three seven one. Two, three, four. And I'll calibrate one more time. <clears throat> now, so we've done the first part where we have collected the information to do the Beer's Law stuff. We can go through now, plug those numbers into your calculator, do the linear regression, get the slope. Okay? We'll do that in a bit. So the next part of the procedure is just to run the experiment. Now the reaction that we are going to do is we're going to use a compound called crystal violet. It's, it changes color based on pH. It's that purplish compound. It doesn't look as pretty in here as it does in this. Okay? We are going to react it with hydroxide ions to produce um, crystal violet, or I guess you could say CBOH. Now, this is purple. Colorless. Mahindra, is this on the screen on the camera? No. How far over? Um, I think a lot to like the left would work. Here? Um, no, a little bit more. Nowhere? <laughs> no, like a. Uh, yeah, I think right there would work. Like where your hand is. No, right there? a little bit. A little bit more. Is that on there? Yeah, right below OH would work. Yeah. Okay. Good enough. So 
what we can do is we can measure how the concentration is going to change over time by using colorimeter. We get the reaction started in a beaker. We transfer it into one of the cuvettes. And we pop the cuvette into the colorimeter and we just we run it and let it collect the concentrations over time. Now, what laws would we be using then to be to determine what the order is for the comp for this reaction? We've got two different types. What's what's one of the different types? Differential rate laws, and the other is, and which one would we be using to determine what the order is based on what I just described? We're going to be con we're going to be measuring the concentration using the colorimeter, and we're going to measure the time. Integrated. Integrated. So the integrated rate laws are time and concentration. Look at the back of your periodic tables again. I know it's been a while. Okay. Bottom, was it bottom left? Is that where they are? Yeah. You got the three of them. Or actually, there's four equations, correct? You got the three integrated rate laws, and you have the T1 half equals 0.693 over K, correct? Is there any, there's not any other equations there, correct? Okay. So the integrated rate laws are using concentration and time data to determine what the order is. Okay. Now, you've had the instructions in front of you. I think it says to use 10 milliliters of crystal violet, and I'm going to mix it with 10 milliliters of sodium hydroxide. Is that correct? Okay, I'm going to measure out the sodium hydroxide first. It really doesn't matter what order it's done in. Wait, did you say 10 milliliters of sodium hydroxide? Yeah. Does it say something different? I think it's 50, it says here. 50 milliliters. It says 50 milliliters. And a 50 milliliter would be <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, that would be a big difference. Wait, <laughs> wait, 50 milliliters of sodium hydroxide. Got it? Yep, got it. Thank 10 you. milliliters, right? Yep, yep. Okay. <laughs> Just make that sure. someone up here to start this. Can you help me out? <laughs> so when I say go, you're going to tap, use that to tap the play button. Okay? What's that? Tap it again. Yeah, you are being recorded. I know. You've said that several times. He's great. <laughs> Just to sit next to him. That's on you. <laughs> Alright, you ready? Go. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, you clap, clap and you did clap. I'm sorry. He goes, he goes, now clap, and I clap, and then you No, know, I said you do. Okay. <laughs> now I'm going to zoom in on this. Is that as far as it goes? Come on. Here we go. 
Now, <laughs> this is one of those things that we would have to go in after we collect the data, and these data points that are at the beginning here, we would get rid of them. I'm not recording any information there, but I needed to make sure that the reaction got started, okay? So, <laughs> even though we're gonna treat this as our time zero, that reaction had already gone for 30 seconds or so. But we're going to get plenty of data with this because we're just going to let it run. Okay? I'm going to let it run for 15 minutes. You see why I don't want to do this lab because it would have taken you guys like 45 minutes to make these and then 15 minutes to run this experiment while you chit chatted. Okay? So, but you can see what's happening. Our, our uh, absorbance is gradually decreasing. Okay, it's gonna be fluctuating a little bit, but it's gradually decreasing because this reaction is occurring and we are going from this purple compound reacting with the hydroxide to make this colorless solution. So the concentration of our purple compound is decreasing. Questions? All right. So as a preview of what's going to be happening here, I'm going to pull up the notes. I'm going to switch this. So go back to the uh, Haley Riggs data that we did with the, uh, <coughs> that did many years ago with the radiation. So what, we, what we're doing right now, we're just letting that thing collect its data, is we're collecting the time data and we're collecting the concentration data. We will use the Beer's Law to do a calculation of what the concentration actually is, right? Because right now, all that thing is doing is recording the absorbance, which we can translate to concentration. Mahindra, on this board, how far do I have that I can write on to be able to see? Mm. Right here, yeah. Okay. So if you remember when we did the Beer's Law, we had B, uh, A equals A, B, C. Now this, on the periodic tables, is in the solids, liquids, and solutions. Everybody see that one? Remember that A is the absorbance. I guess she's the big A. The small A is your slope or the absorptivity constant. I'm just gonna say slope. The B is the path length. And that's the distance that the light has to travel through the solution. So like in this thing here, the path length would be one centimeter because it's a one centimeter cuvette. And C is the concentration measured in moles per liter. Try to refresh your memories and stuff, right? So we would use this equation here to get our concentration column. That would allow us to make graph number one, which would be the time versus the concentration. And we take that data 
and mathematically change it to be the natural log of that concentration. And we can make a second graph of the natural log of the concentration versus time. And then we're going to make a third calculation where we're going to calculate what is the inverse of that concentration and plot it against time. One of those three will give us a straight line. If it's the concentration versus time, what order will it be? If the straight line is concentration versus time, zero order. In this experiment, if we run it, if we collect it and we do the natural log of the concentration versus time, and that gives us the straight line, it's what order? First order. And if we do the inverse of the concentration versus time, that would be second order. Only one of those is going to give you a straight line. Which one gives you the straight line is going to be the one that tells you what the order is. Are we okay with that? Okay. I'm going to pause here to say, does anybody have any questions? Again, anything I've said that like brought up a question that you've had, stuff that you looked at? Taylor? So how did we know that the first agreement was in first order. This one? Mm -hmm. So if we look at this graph here, this is the graph of the concentration versus time. And we can see that our data, especially here, looks oh, curvy. Oh, it's the dots. Yeah, they're hard to see. It was just like they're just lines. And it's this one that gave us a, the they're not straight line. It's experimental data. Remember, I'm holding a Geiger, in this case, I was holding a Geiger counter up to a girl's neck, okay? But we're getting data well enough to tell us that this was a first order process. Our data that we're collecting from this is gonna look similar. Oh, for crying out loud. No, it's not Savannah. That's me. This is all me. I forgot to change the time length. It only ran for 300 seconds. Five minutes. Not enough time. Okay, crap. So we take uh, 10 times 60, 600, so it's 600, 600 seconds. Don't Other questions? All right. Then we're going to talk about we talk about catalysts, right? Talk about catalysts? Yeah. Okay.
Okay, so energy diagram, potential energy, time on the, or uh, potential energy on the X, Y axis, time on the X axis. <coughs> the peaks and valleys tell you, or basically showing you what steps there are. Remember how we counted the number of peaks to determine how many steps. Okay, so in this one here, as a reminder again, to do a quick review, here's our reactants. These are our products. The red line represents that that reaction is occurring in one single step. The blue line is representing a catalyzed reaction, and that catalyzed reaction is occurring in two separate steps. Even though it's occurring in two separate steps, the blue represents a faster reaction because the amount of energy required for the reaction to take place is significantly smaller than what the reaction that's uncatalyzed takes. It may seem counterintuitive. You have more steps, it's going to take time. No. In this case, the time it's going to take is going to be dependent upon how much energy is required to get past a certain point. Same thing's happening down here. Whatever imaginary reaction this is, the red represents a single step reaction. The blue represents a, looks like a three step process. Notice though, that in the catalyzed and uncatalyzed reactions, the reactions start at the same potential energy and they end at the same potential energy. So the enthalpy change, the enthalpy change will be the same whether it's catalyzed or uncatalyzed. Think of this as kind of like the Hess's law thing. It doesn't matter where you start or, or it doesn't matter how the reaction takes place. All that matters is where did you start and where do you end. Different pathways. They're giving you the same result. It's just what's happening in between the beginning and the end that's different. Okay. Questions? Now, talking about the steps that, have, that occur in looking at those energy profiles kind of introduces the basic idea of what we call a reaction mechanism. There are a series of steps for the reaction to take place those series of steps in total is called the reaction mechanism. Now what, reaction, what reactions are taking place, what compounds, what elements are involved in each step may be different, but in the end, those individual steps are going to give you the overall chemical equation. <clears throat> I'm going to get out some definition stuff here. So, Reaction mechanisms, the steps that you take for the reaction to go from reactants to products. Each step in the mechanism is called an elementary step. Okay? Each step is an elementary step. Now, we have different names associated with those. Unimolecular, that would be one molecule just breaking apart. Bimolecular, that's going to be two molecules involved. Termolecular is going to be three molecules involved. Now, in terms of the term molecular, I don't know that my, my saying it's very rare is correct. It, these tend to be slow reactions because to get three molecules to collide all at the same time, it's not an easy thing to do. In terms of the number of particles colliding at any one time, it's pretty easy to get two molecules to collide. It's getting three molecules to collide at the same time, it's a little bit challenging. So, but we also have other criteria. We've got them, to, we need them to collide, but what else do we need? Orientation. We need orientation and we need the energy. 
So remember, this goes back to the very first lecture. For our reactions to take place, you have to have a collision. That collision has to have enough energy, and the collision has to be in the right orientation. Those are your three criteria. There is, really isn't a collision if it's just a decomposition where you have molecules just falling apart. But if you've got a collision between two molecules, okay, now you've got to have the right amount of energy and you have to right, have the ha right, right orientation for those two. This is what makes termolecular reactions well, fairly slow. Because you have to get three molecules to collide, but they all have to be in the right orientation and have the correct amount of energy. Now, the react this, this kind of goes to talking about Hess's law here. The mechanism must match the overall balanced equation and match the rate law determined experimentally. Let me talk about the first part here. So let's say that I had making stuff up, okay? If this is step one, if this is step two, if this is step three, this would be my mechanism. The overall reaction would basically be the sum of this. sum of this equal? If we go through and cancel the things that are the same on both sides, if we go through and add the th things that are same on one side, let's we'll start off by what cancels. What's going to cancel in this? XY cancels. Does anything else cancel? Y. Y, but it doesn't cancel completely, right? So what is our overall reaction? If I were to write out the chemical equation for this as an overall equate or overall reaction, what would it be? 2x plus a plus it's going to give us x squared. That makes sense? I'm not sure how well this shows up on that. Okay. So it says the mechanism must match the overall balanced equation. So let's say that we do a series of experiments. I'm almost ready to go back and get that data. We do a series of experiments and find out that these are the actual steps that take place. And this is the overall chemical equation. They match. Check. All right. If these did not add up to give us this, then that wouldn't be the correct mechanism, right? There'd have to be something else going on. Each of these steps has its own individual rate. Now the rate of step one, 
and this is a differential rate law, would be as follows. It would be first order with X and first order with Y. And we don't have to do any kind of experiments to determine that. Here's the difference between this, what I just said, and what we started off the unit with. When we did differentiated rate laws, and we were doing the uh, <coughs> method of initial rates, remember we compared two reactions, we did an experiment, compared two reactions, changed the, uh, one of the compounds, didn't change the other, saw how it affected the rate. Everybody remember that? We had to do that because we had an overall equation. We had this. In our mechanism, each step is called an elementary step. Each step is called an elementary step. And each step, the rate law, the exponents in the rate law are the coefficients of the reactants from the reaction. Now, make sure you're crystal clear about this. We cannot look at this and say what the order of X is going to be. We can't say, look at this and say, what's the order of A? We can't look at this and say, what's the order of Y? Because this is an overall equation. But if these are elementary steps, in these individual steps, we can say that the order of x in this is first, because the coefficient is 1. You cannot do that down here. Okay. The rate, for, the rate law for experiment 2 would be x times xy. Now, our rate laws can only have, for the rate law for the, for the whole reaction, or I should say the rate law for the overall reaction, can only include the reactants in the overall equation. We have a step here where we have x is one of the reactants, but xy is not. What is xy called? It's an intermediate. It's a compound that is produced as part of the process, but later gets used as part of the process. So xy does not occur anywhere in this overall equation because it gets produced in the first step, but then it gets used in the second step. Is everybody okay with how I've written out the rate laws for each of the individual steps? Mahindra, what you, you got a, a very... Would Y be an intermediate? So an intermediate is something that gets produced as part of the, as part of the mechanism. And so this compound XY is getting produced, but then in this step here it's getting consumed again. That's why it doesn't show up in this equation, because it's going to cancel out. Now, in a mechanism, the slowest step will determine the rate of the reaction, and it's called the rate determining step. We kind of already talked about this, right? We looked at it with the, with the uh, energy profiles. So if we go back, and we look at this one and say, this is going to be the rate determining step because it requires the most amount of energy for the reaction to take place. Now, 
That means that each of these reactions, I should have rate three on this, each of these three reactions, the individual steps will be occurring at a different rate. They will not all be the same rate. Meaning one of them is going to be the slowest reaction. Now, let's say, we'll start off with the easiest. Let's say that this is the slow step. And when I put fast for the other two, I'm not saying that they're equal in their how fast they're going. I'm just saying they're fast compared to the slow step. One step is going to be slower than all the others. That slow step determines the rate of the reaction. That slow step also determines the rate law. And that's why this is the easiest question you could ever have asked. If the slow step is the first step, this is the rate law for the reaction. What order is X? First order. What order is Y? First order. What order is A? Zero. Because where is A not? It's not in this first step, is it? So think of this way. We could add more of compound A, correct? And if we did, that would make this third step go faster. Because if we increase the amount of A, we're going to make this rate go faster. But does making this rate go faster make the first step go faster? No. So if a compound or a reactant occurs after the slow step, it automatically is going to be zero order. If a compound or reactant occurs after the slow step, it has to be zero order. Because the only thing that's going to affect the rate of the reaction is by affecting the slow step. You want to change the slow step to make the reaction go faster. So if I added more X, more compound X, would th that make this reaction, the overall reaction, go faster? Why? You're right, it's going to offer more collisions, but more importantly, where is it? What is in the first reaction? X is. If X wasn't in the first reaction, it wouldn't be affecting the first reaction, right? So we can change the concentration of X in our first reaction and change the rate. If I add Y, because Y is a reactant, I'm going to change the rate of the reaction because X and Y are both part of the first step. If I, add, if I add more compound A, that is not going to do anything to this first rate, which means it's not going to speed up the rate of the reaction. Now I'm going to bring it back to the very first day when we were doing differentiated rate laws. Notice that in this, the overall equation, x has a coefficient of 2. But what is the order for x in this reaction? It's first. That's why you cannot look at an overall equation 
and say what the order is based on the coefficients. But you can for the individual steps. How did you know that they're in first order? Like that x and y are in first order? Because that's, that's, that's true of elementary steps. Whatever the coefficient is, that is the order for that compound in the, element, in the elementary step. So I'm going to take the opportunity again to reinforce. This is an overall equation, OK? So before today, if I asked you to write out the rate law for this equation, you wouldn't be able to do it without more information. Because you would say, all right, I can do rate equals k times the concentration of x raised to some power. I'm going to make it uh, a. y raised to some power. Make it b. And then a raised to some power. That's all you would be able to tell me if we didn't have any more information. Now, all I gave you was this. I could give you a series of reactions say, in this experiment, the concentrations of x, y, and a were this, and the rate was this. I can do another experiment, say, this is the concentration of x, y, and a. Change one of them, keep the other one the same. And this is the rate. And you can use that method of initial rates to figure out what those exponents are. Okay? So A is zero order because the first step is the rate determining step. Correct. This is the rate determining step. And the rate determining step, the rate law for it, is the rate law for the reaction overall. So we could say now, based on this information here, that this is the rate law for that reaction. So if like what if step like hypothetically, if step three was the rate determining step, then would like x be a zero order? Oh no, x would be at least the second order because x, so what would happen is if you added x, it would make, if this was the slow step, adding x makes both of these reactions go faster. So adding x is going to be, you know, it, it's not just you're changing it for this reaction, you're changing it for this reaction as well. It gets complex when you get further down in the steps and you're rate determining steps down here. That's why I said, I'm gonna start off with the easy one. This is the easiest one. If, you're, if your first step is the rate determining step, then your rate law is that step's rate law. Okay? The furthest I've seen on the AP exam go is where they have the second step be the slow step. Now, I'm going to give you a really rough, not 100% way of doing the rate law if it's a second step. So I'm going to reset somewhat here and say, OK. The first step's not the slow step. The second step is. Now what they'll say is this the first step is a fast equilibrium, which means what happens is, is that this first step is producing a compound that's required for the second step, right? So what happens is you get a buildup of this and it gets produced faster than it can get used up here. And you get to what's called an equilibrium. Now That means that this equation right here is the rate law for the reaction. The 
what's the problem with that rate law being the rate law for the reaction overall? Steiner? Is it because of the XY? It's because of the XY. What's the only thing that can be in your rate laws? The reactants from what? The overall equation. Now, this is the rate law for this reaction here. The problem is that it has XY in it. The only things we can have in our rate law are X, A, and Y. We can already say right now, what is A's order going to be? Zero, because it's after the slow step. Okay, so I'm going to tell you another thing. So in terms of a zero order, if the compound comes after the slow step, it's zero order. If a compound occurs before or in the slow step, it must be zero, or one or second order. Any compound that occurs before or in the slow step will affect the rate of the reaction. Yeah, because the only choices we have for in, in this in this course are going to be zero, first, and second order. Now, like I said, this may not work. This is not going to work for every problem that you may be presented with from your textbook, but. Fairly certain it's going to work for 95% of the questions if you were presented with something like this on the AP exam. So we're going to go with it. Because otherwise, it's a lot of math. Okay? Did you say if it occurs before, it, it, it will be first order or it can be first or second? It'd be first or second. So it, it depends on it depends on the coefficients. <clears throat> now so we've already said that A is going to be zero order. Both X and Y have to have an order that's one and two. Why? Because they are, Y occurs before this reaction and X occurs in both, right? And here's the thing. If I make this reaction go faster, I'm going to produce more and more of this, right? And what will happen is you'll get more of this compound, which means if I have more of that compound, what happens to this step? It goes faster. So if you produce this compound at a faster rate, it is going to make the second reaction go faster. So steps prior to the slow step can make the slow step faster. Or will, I should say, steps prior to the slow step will affect the slow step. Steps after the slow step will not affect the slow step. Now, this is the really, uh, it, this, again, this is just a quick, dirty way of getting the answers and not worrying about all the details. And yes, it may get a wrong answer sometimes. Not often for what we are doing in this class. <laughs> Count how many times does the compound occur up to and including the slow step. That's the order. So how many times does X occur up to and including the slow step? Twice. Second order. How many times does Y occur up to and including the slow step? Once. First order. That's it.
like I said, there is a long drawn out way of going through and doing the math to determine what that rate law is. We're not, I, it, it's not worth our time to do it, okay? Questions? Thursday, right? I'm sorry, Wednesday, Friday next week. Then I've got you guys taking the test on the 30th, 31st, 30th, 31st. That's a Monday. I don't like Monday tests, but it has to be. Steiner? Uh, when counting for the order, do you only count the reactants? Correct. So the why well, okay. I need to back up because this is. I, I I'll get in more detail with this next time in class. So I've emphasized that you can only have the reactants that are occurring in your reaction in your rate law. A little curveball that gets thrown to us though is catalysts. Because catalysts don't show up in the overall equation, right? But so, because a catalyst is going, it catalyst is going to show up in a mechanism as a reactant first. So when you're going through and doing the owls, if you're asked to identify, you know, a catalyst or an uh, or an intermediate, a catalyst will be a reactant first, then a product later. An intermediate will be a product first then a reactant after that. Well, the problem with a catalyst is that it is actually a reactant. It's it, for that mechanism, when you have a, a, a catalyst involved, it has to be part of the rate law in one way, shape, or form. Or could, I say, I, should, I shouldn't say it should. It could be part of the rate law. Meaning that, let's say that we had Q in here. Q was a catalyst. And we ended up with Q out here. I mean, we're just making stuff up, right? Well, that would include, that would make Q part of our and Q wouldn't get canceled out until later on. Q has to show up in our rate law. It doesn't show up in our overall, but we could. Sometimes you, you can write Q plus Q. I, I know it doesn't look like it makes sense, but that's correct because you have a catalyst you're going to end up as a product. So you can only have reactants that are part of your overall equation. And even though the catalyst doesn't show up in your overall equation, it can still show up in your rate law because it is a reactant in your overall equation. Okay? It's one of those things just weird. All right. Let's see here.
You guys are on Center Grove Secure, right? No. <coughs> you should be. They like tell us that we're not supposed to. No, you're supposed to be on Center Grove Secure. Every other teacher. Talks They're about idiots. Us. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> you're supposed to be on Center Grove Secure. Non non school stuff is supposed to be on just secure. So if you got if you got your own personal iPad, yeah, you're on Center Grove. If you have a school iPad, you should be on Center Grove Forget it and then start like that. Because it's Center Grove all one. I can't forget it. Dash secure. Yeah. Or is it underlined? Dash. Dash. Oh. Is anything capitalized? Let's see. Oh. Okay. That's right. Okay. Let's lie to you a little bit. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, here's why I have to lie to you. I can't get that to connect to the network, so I can't get the data off of it. So I'm going to use previous year's data, okay? So I'm lying to you, but I'm not lying to you. We're just not using your the data we collect in class. So do we need to make that table? Because there's no. No, I'm just going to show you what I'm, I'm going to show you the process that we would do. Okay, because you would never be asked to do this on the AP exam. You wouldn't be asked to do this on the my exam. You would be presented with the information. Okay, so I have the absorbance data. We will use your. Do a linear regression of the uh, beer, the beer's law stuff. Get your calculators, plug those values in, and tell me what the do the linear regression, and tell me what your slope is. Okay. What's that?
Okay, we get that slope yet? You know what? Okay, hold on. Put the absorbances in, but leave the first column. The first column open. Um, so your original molarity is twenty five. need to do this for 40, 35, 30, 25, 20, 15, and then 10. What's this equal? 25 times 40 divided by 50. How much? This one's going to be, so 25 times 35 divided by 50. So that's going to be 12.5, 10. 7.5, is that right? And then five. So in your calculator, the pure was 25. 40 is gonna be equal to 20. 35 is going to be 17.5. So what is the absorbance of 25? Twenty 
to 5, 20, no. <laughs> Okay, what was the first absorbance? 4.062. Second one? 0.940. Third? 0.921. Next? 0.737. Seven what? 3.7. Next? 0.703. Next? 0.537. Next. Next. Okay. So our slope is point zero. Four two four. What I would plug into this equation here is I, I would say I'm going to take this absorbance, because I'm going to rearrange this equation, okay? I'm going to take that absorbance, I'm going to divide it by the constant to give me my concentration. B drops out because B is 1. Remember, the path length is 1. So I'm going to take that divided by 0 0.0, was it 424? Yes. So that's the concentration of my crystal violet to start with, or at least one I put it in. Now I'm going to calculate all of the concentrations, okay? Now if I take and plot this and this, I'm going to make a graph. <coughs> X, Y scatter. It's a straight little curve. Okay. I'm going to do now equals this value. Oh, actually, natural log. L in that. Crap. L in that. L in no L in cooperate. Thank you. Now, if I take and make a graph of those two, straight, yes. straighter, right? So we can say that it is not what? This was concentration of time. It's not what? We can say the natural log in time is first order. Now let's make, well, we're going to do the last one and make a comparison because you never know equals 1 divided by this, calculate them out, so we did this and this chart, hey, there we go, curve, so what order is it, first order, for the crystal violet. Because we measured the change in the concentration of the crystal violet. What didn't we measure the change in the concentration of? Uh, OH. Okay. Now, 
there's a way of going through and determining what that is using, we'd have to run a second experiment. I'm not going to do that, but I want you guys to see how you would do this. Okay. Doing it this way saved me literally two days. A day of doing it and then a day of explaining how to set it up on your iPads to do all those calculations, right? I'm pretty sure you don't remember your Excel from Keystone class when you guys did computers in Keystone class. Although those of you who have done computer business applications you probably do this in a breeze. Questions? Mahindra, do me a favor. Hit stop on that for me, please.